Today I'm joined by Inez Stepman. Uh, Inez is a Lincoln Fellow at the Claremont Institute. Uh, she is a writer for The Federalist, um, a senior policy analyst at the Independent Women's Forum, and the host of the brand new podcast, High Noon. Welcome, Inez. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, it's lovely to have you on. I mean, I've been following you on Twitter for a while. Um, I, I've noticed that you've um, you mentioned in your Twitter bio that you are an, an anti-feminist, and you state it uh, proudly. <laughs> you uh, this this is one of your kind of um, orientational bits that that people see uh, the first time they interact with you on Twitter. Um, I I'm kind of. I used to call myself an anti-feminist. I probably would still be in that camp in a way. Um, I'm curious because I've been I've been chatting to a lot of people who still identify with the label of feminist, but you know they have different takes on what it means to be one. Uh, do you think there's anything salvageable under that concept? Is there anything that can be recaptured? Was was there anything ever under the under the hood of feminism that that's worthwhile? The, the reason that I call myself an anti-feminist, and, and even though I think there are some perhaps policies, particularities that can be salvaged from the feminist movement or the feminist project, um, is because I think I disagree with the central premise as far as uh, my reading um, into the feminist movement of all different waves uh, has yielded. And I'll put it the way they would put it first, and then I'll, I'll go into why I disagree with it. I think the most universal definition of feminism is the... Um, social, political, and economic equality between the sexes. Um, this is one of these definitions that sort of brings in, it's not overly niche, it doesn't get into the differences between the sex positive and the sex negative, the different waves. I think almost everybody who calls themselves a feminist would agree to that statement. And my evidence for that is that it's both in the, the definition in the Merriam-Webster dictionary, and it's uh, the definition that Beyonce reads in her songs. So you get the pop culture imprimatur and Merriam-Webster, um, I think there are probably feminists who say that doesn't go far enough. There are probably feminists who say it does. You know, there's all kinds of disagreements, but I, I tend to find that this is an unobjectionable definition, working definition of feminism. And even on that very basic level, it seems to me that it's missing something. Um, I, I, the, the central premise going back all the way even to the first wave of feminism in, in the United States that I disagree with is that our, our sex, our biology um, should have very, it seems like they think it should have very little impact on how we live our lives, how society should be organized, um, any of these fundamental questions about who we are. And I, I think actually our biological sex is, is quite central to our identities. It's obviously not deterministic of our identities, but I, I do think that it's quite central. And therefore I'm skeptical of this whole premise of the, the social, political, and economic equality between the sexes. I think that's both probably impossible and also undesirable. Um, and I would rather start as a baseline with the uh, throwing out the notion that masculinity and femininity are socially constructed, although of course they are performed in some way that is done within a society, uh, but throwing out the basis that that's socially constructed, that sex is socially constructed in any way, and not just in the most radical form where we see today, where we say even biological sex, you know, you can change from male to female um, on the basis of identity and whim. Um, but even even in the the less obvious sense, I mean, our, it's not just our our bits that are different; it's our brains, our hormones, um, who we are comes in a large part from that identity and from that biological reality. And it seems to me to be a much more productive discussion to start with that premise and then say, okay, how can society, uh, you know, in a healthy way channel, you know, and raise men and women into, you know, and, and masculinity and femininity and construct them in such a way in society that um, reflects or honors who we are biologically and, and also leaves room for exceptions and weirdos. I'm like, I'm a big fan of weirdos. Right. I, I don't think there's anything. I don't think that um, the dominant paradigm has to describe everybody in order to be useful. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. And I think in, in the um, in the kind of the, the self concept of, of mainstream feminism, there's also this, this idea of the patriarchy, um, which uh, kind of pits women against men as, you know, men being the, the owners of, of culture, the creators of culture, the, the essentially the mold in which in which everything happens and for which all of society has been created. Um, and then um, 
you know, there's there's this, this story, essentially, if, if you look at mainstream feminism, obviously, there are offshoots and, and kind of different schools. But this, you know, the core idea of feminism that you hear all the time is that up until maybe 1960, women had, you know, were essentially kind of a slave class that they were subjugated in myriad ways that they were unfree, um, that they, you know, just essentially kind of were having a miserable time since since the since the dawn of time. Um, I think would would you object to that as well? Like the idea that you know women, you know, would just just had a raw deal until liberal feminism freed them from from the chains of oppression around 1963, maybe. Yeah, um, obviously, I disagree with that idea, and I think the declining rates of female happiness, both absolutely and relative to men, since the 1970s, are a big stumbling block to people who see the world that way. Uh, but more. More specifically, no one ever says this about their grandmothers. Have you noticed that? It's always, my grandmother was a strong woman. She was a lovely woman, a kind woman. Um, nobody tends to think of their grandmothers, unless they came from some kind of truly abusive situation or horrible situation, assuming sort of normal family relations. Nobody tends to think of their grandmother as an oppressed doormat. Um, and yet we have no problem generalizing and talking about women that way. I mean, Simone de Beauvoir uh, actually laments this, right? She says that um, the condition of women is unique uh, among the oppressed classes uh, because we are tied to our oppressors. Um, in, you know, to, to put it in, in a more base way, there's a lot of fraternizing with the enemy and there always will be. Um, so if, if you divide if you divide into the oppressor and the oppressed in that way on sex on a sex basis, um, you're necessarily going to miss the complexity of male female relationships, which make up the, the building block of life. Um, and I, I just, I, she actually laments this um, before laments this. She basically said, um, for for uh, blacks or Jews, you could imagine. She's this is before saying it. Um, you could imagine that one day you could rise up and like either separate yourself from your oppressors or kill them or like in some way disconnect yourself uh, from, from your oppressors. Women can never connect, disconnect themselves from men. She says that this is part of the reason that women are particularly oppressed and their condition is particularly lamentable. Um, but I, I would give it as evidence, uh, or reason to throw out the entire construct of the oppressor and the oppressed, which is an impoverished way to view almost anything anyway. Um, particularly in the modern age, it's, it's too flat. I think a lot of times and a, a lens through which to, to, view anything, but but especially something that is as subtle and complicated, um, more of a dance, right, uh, as, as the relations between the sexes. It's such a, such a terrible lens, because um, the only two lenses we, we talk about anything anymore are oppression and oppressed and power, which are, I think, intimately related. But I think both of those are just a terrible way to describe the relations between the sexes, and I think any marriage therapist would probably agree. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think there's there's something to be said about the uh, the the idea of the individual that that we have nowadays. That you know we're kind of these extreme, completely separate, you know, choice making uh, entities that uh, exist in society, and uh, you know we we produce things, we consume things, we make rational choices day by day, and then any sort of um, imposition either by biology or society, tradition, family, all of this stuff is is uh, arbitrary and you know is is best left in the past is 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 you know ancient history and and we should treat it that way because it makes us unfree and now you see this as well with kind of like transgenderism seems to me kind of like the the, the this this ideology taken to a fever pitch where you have to get divorced and away from your body as well, which is just kind of like a video game skin that you can try on, take off. You know, there there are different parts that you can screw on, screw off. Uh, you know, depending on depending on your mood or or on your state of mind. Um, to me, that you know, I think that also ties into kind of how we we deal with the market. The fact that you know we're we're kind of we're interacting with the market on an individual basis you know it doesn't the market doesn't deal with communities doesn't deal with families it deals with you the person who responds to the marketing advertisement or whatever you know uh, pleasure seeking thing that that they're selling you today so i'm curious what you think about this idea of a, an impoverished concept of the individual that's completely detached from from everyone else and that you know this is the the role that we're we're thrust into and this is the role that we're playing 
Um, well, here maybe I, I dissent from the dissident, right? <laughs> I I um, I think the problem is less capitalism than it is, and when I say problem, I mean it's both a problem and an enormous blessing is prosperity. I think um, Anna Kachian, uh, of Red Scare, lays this out in the way that um, I think is probably way more articulate than I'm going to say it, um, and with different conclusions, by the way, but the idea that family and community, um, they're incredibly important, but also, you know, they, they do in, in a fundamental way trap you. Um, and the, the difference is, I think it's more prosperity than capitalism for this reason. Um, it used to be that you just didn't have a choice. You, ha you were stuck with your family um, unless you wanted to, to starve on the street. You were stuck with your family. And there were really, really good aspects of that uh, because the family was much stronger. But I think to the extent that it's inevitable that we've atomized to some degree, I don't know what degree of it is inevitable. I think it is somewhat inevitable that by prosperity, some of those bonds would be cut because the only reason they were in place um, was to save you from starving on the street. When we saved ourselves collectively, um, I'd say through capitalism and through enormous production of wealth, when we saved ourselves collectively, um, in, in especially in the first world countries, from starving in the street, you necessarily weaken the bonds of dependence in a family. And I, I don't know how to fix that because I, I also, you know, I, I agree with Wellebeck that it's, um, you know, that we are too atomized, that, that uh, the essential ties um, between community and family are, <laughs> are extremely important to us not being just uh, in a, a constant floating search for meaning um, in, in church too. Um, put that in that bucket. So I don't necessarily have an answer, but I, I'm not sure that it's, it's capitalism as much as I think if, if you had a prosperous society in which people are freed from the, the economic constraints, I think you'd see, even if it wasn't capitalist, I think you would see, um, you would see those, those restraints break down or those bonds break down um, in a similar, in a similar way. Um, and actually within a, a capitalist, vaguely capitalist society, even something like social security, which is, is um, in America, which is a basic social safety net program, right? And the, the vast majority of people support, uh, that also frees you in your old age from being wholly dependent on your family, right? So people don't have to have kids so that they're not out on the street when they're old because they have a social safety net to do it. So I'm not sure it's capitalism. I, I could see the same effect with a large social safety net, or I think it's just generally a society that's wealthy enough to save its members from the imminent threat of, of starvation um, when they're alone is going to make it easier to leave communities, to leave families. And when it's easier, people will do it because it's not always pleasant to be part of a family or a community. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Um, I think the capitalism has proven to be the the, the major force behind the uh, you know the accumulation of this wealth. So, in a way, it's uh, you know it's kind of, it's kind of been the the motor for for all these changes. But yeah, I think I think you're right in terms of um, you know the fact that it's all it's a revealed preference, as they say in economics. You know, being away from your family is you know a revealed preference uh, of having having distance, having your own your own space, uh, cultivating independence and all this stuff. Yeah, it is a revealed preference. But at the same time, um, I think it's it's one of those things where it's, it's been really hard for us to strike a balance because there's not there's no clear line of where how how distant you can be from from other people until something starts to break down in you as a social animal. Uh, and then you get that feeling of, you know, alienation and anime, atomization, whatever everyone talks about nowadays, you know, the the, the mental health issues that you know keep popping up in, in different ways. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that's that's a big, a big question. But I, I definitely agree with you. I mean, it's it's comfort. It's you know, it's um, it's it's the mouse utopia. <laughs> we're we're slowly, we're slowly kind of lulling ourselves into into uh, yeah a, a different stage of humanity. Yeah, I mean, so I agree with you that capitalism was the engine that created this wealth. I think that's 
overall a good thing. I think it has this side effect. I guess what I object to is the idea that if we had a more socialistic society, that those ties between people would be stronger rather than- Oh yeah. I actually totally, I think the, in some ways the opposite, I see the atomizing tendency that the wealth produced by capitalism creates. And I, I see the problems there. And I think those are the problems that confront us in this particular age. Um, that being said, two things. One, I, I'm not thrilled about the idea of going back to starving on the street, and <laughs> obviously, but but um, more more importantly, I, it's not clear to me that building like a, a more socialistic society actually solves that problem. In fact, to the extent that we have examples of communist societies, I think your your family, my family, right? Um, it, yeah, it for breaks, sure. It breaks even more those bonds between families um yeah it breaks them the in a different way really yeah absolutely i agree i think uh i think you know the this binary of uh you know we're, we're either a capitalist or we're sliding into into to communism i think what what capitalism at this stage in its existence sorely needs and i think what kind of a, a conservative movement needs is a is a kind of considered critique of consumerism or of what of what this does to a person of kind of looking at okay you know there's obviously the, the immense wealth that this creates but you know what are the consequences of this on you know even individual psyches on the family on you know this in, this, this intermediating role that prosperity plays because in a way you know you you've been if you're responsible for creating this enormous wealth you kind of have to also deal with you know the the, the secondary consequences uh, and you know the, the, if you if you look at the kind of the form that capitalism takes um a lot in and now in kind of this uh this uh kind of cowboy capitalism that you have for example with big tech you know there's quite a lot of agglomeration at the top there's a lot of winner take all dynamics you know it's you have uh, industries who have extremely high um network externalities you know you form natural monopolies in certain areas so there's there's certain dynamics that kind of make make this uh, a bit more of an interesting thing and i feel like a lot of times um conservative critics they they stop at that and they you know they don't necessarily want to open up that pandora's box because it feels like oh, okay you know the alternative is going to be socialism uh, no that's that's not what i meant actually maybe i should clarify it i don't mean that we're sliding towards communism economically i'm, I'm saying that providing more of a social safety net which is often which in some cases I think maybe the, the correct policy and in other cases, no. So I'm not dogmatic um, or ideological about that, uh, that question, but I also don't think it solves the underlying identity crisis. Um, so I wrote a piece with my husband, which I highly recommend actually, it's a really interesting couples exercise, but um, I wrote a piece with my husband for the American mind a while back uh, talking about the Trump election of 2016. And this is most before um, 2020, and whether it was essentially, um, whether our, the crisis in America was due to economics or due to, to culture. And of course, there's a chicken and egg aspect of this, um, and they feed into each other, but our argument was essentially that it is primarily cultural. Um, and, and the evidence for that would be that during the, the Trump boom, um, there was legitimately a blue collar boom, that blue collar families, working families were doing better um, under the Trump administration, um, in, in the economically speaking, and yet we were at each other's throats at a higher fever pitch culturally than than we were several years prior when we had not seen any rebounds in some of the like long term negative economic trends that have no doubt did feed into Trump's election. Right? Um, I just I don't I don't think that economics always precedes. There, there is certain um, elements in the, in the macro sense, like I do think moving away from, for example, an era in which um, it was a economic necessity to have a lot of kids uh, into one where it's not an economic necessity to have a lot of kids. I think that does affect family structure. Um, so on that macro level, I think economics precedes it. But on the, the, the more um, you know, country level, you know, are, are we going to go with this, this economic policy or that economic policy within certain parameters, let's say, you know, not, not full communism and not completely like anarchism um, within that spectrum. I'm not sure that, that fiddling around with some of these economic policies, sometimes it's a positive, um, sometimes it's a negative, but I just don't think it gets at the heart of the problem. I think the heart of the problem is cultural. I think 
for example, the heart of the reason why people are not having a lot of kids, it may be that they're not having 10 kids because it's no longer economically beneficial to have 10 kids, but the reason they're not having any is cultural and it's a cultural choice. And I, I don't think that it's primarily driven by economics. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, you know, there's there's these, um, you know, there, there are some people who say, okay, you know, people aren't having kids because they literally cannot afford to have one child. Um, I, I disagree because I know a lot of people who can afford many, many things and they do and they are not having children and they're, you know, at prime child having age and they're either postponing it or not even considering it at all or saying that they're not going to have children because, you know, polar bears are screaming in Antarctica or some some sort of environmentally motivated reason to, to not I, have I don't children. buy that either, by the way. I don't I don't believe that a single, okay, I shouldn't say a single person, but I don't buy that people aren't having kids because they care about the polar bears. I think that they like their lifestyle and they want to keep it. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I just don't buy, I don't buy all the, the sort of gloss around it. I don't, I don't think that it's honest. Um, I think if they sat with themselves in a room for long enough, I think they would admit that they just don't want to have a kid because it's going to wreck their lifestyle that they enjoy. Um, and they don't want to say that because it sounds selfish. So they, want to say, say, they say like, we want to save the polar bears. I just don't buy it. I don't buy the like performance about the environmentalism. I do buy that people care about the environment and they care about climate change and all that, but I don't buy that's not, that that is the reason they're not having kids. The vast, vast majority of people. Yeah. I think it's in, in a way for some people who are really into kind of this Gaia cult, uh, they, they really buy into it in the sense that there's not enough good reasons to have children. Like, I think that's that's also the problem. Like, there's not really any positives at the moment for someone, for example, living, you know, the 20 something, 30 something lifestyle in a big city. Um, the, you know, the infrastructure is not there. Most people of, you know, my age are not really having children. I mean, I'm, I'm now having my, my first baby at 32 and I'm congratulations, <laughs> by the way. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of an outlier as well, because I mean, I have, you know, my friends from from London, they you know, they just, just, it's not, it's not in the cards for them at, at this point. So it's a, uh, it's a bit of a strange thing. Cause yeah, you're, you're kind of, you become ostracized. It's yeah, it's just not a, it's not a thing to do. Um, it's, I don't know. It's, 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 it's a strange, uh, situation to, to be in, uh, if you're, you know, if you kind of, you kind of have to venture out and almost like a pioneer decide that you want to have children and then kind of reconstruct your whole life around, around this decision. Um, and yeah, some people, well, I can understand why they won't. It's it's interesting. Um, I don't know how much of this, and I'd be very curious for your thoughts on it, um, not being from the United States. I don't know how much of this is American culture, but in comparison to other cultures, I have found that the United States has like a real cultural divide between people with children and people without, i.e. the generations don't mix. There are, there are cohorts. Um, and that, that means that oftentimes having a kid means that you not only have a child and have that enormous change in your life, but you move out from the neighborhoods where your friends live and you move out into the suburbs where, and, and people get mad at me all the time for saying this, but I find them very atomizing and like kind of, um, artificial, uh, and you, you move out, you move out to the suburbs, then, um, you know, you only have friends who are at the exact same stage of life, whereas it seems to me like, I don't know, if, if you go out in Paris, you see people bring their kids to like restaurants um, and, and they don't misbehave. So there's, there's that as well. Um, but it, it seems to me that life is, that it, the generations are more integrated than they are in America. In America, it's very, like you're in the college cohort, you're in the, you're in the high school cohort, you're in the college cohort, you're in the like sort of young professional cohort, you're in the, you know, late twenties, early thirties cohort, then you're in the like family cohort, right? Um, and there's very little, it's like very few people, for example, I, I don't know how many parties I've been to only a handful in my entire life in America, where there were both people considerably younger, i.e. kids and considerably older there. Um, and that That's, I think that's probably a bigger barrier to people having kids than anything else. They don't, they can't imagine their social life, um, not just in the the cheap way, like they, they won't have the time or the energy to, or the money to go, you know, out to dinner or, or to go to bars or something like that, but they can't imagine the connections they have with their friends, with their family and how those things will change um, as opposed to having a more multi-generational life experience and including your social life where you have, 
you've been always been going to parties where some of your friends had kids and there were people younger than you and people older than you and and your parents were friends with um, or even grandparents were friends with other people that kind of thick community um intergenerational community i think doesn't really exist as often here i don't know if it used to i'm not an expert on american culture prior to my birth yeah <laughs> it's um i think I think it's it's also a, a phenomenon of you know these you know these these mega cities like I, I think this is essentially the same stratification that you have in a place like London, which is you know a, a major European city, but yeah that that describes it fairly well. You know you would move to a different neighborhood, um, you know when when you're single you probably live in a you know cheap you know community somewhere downtown close to close to all the activity. Then you'd move to the suburbs once you have children. Um, it describes it less so here in, in my hometown in, in Romania, where, you know, you kind of have, you know, you, you mingle with your childhood friends and they, you know, have children at different times and, you know, parents are much more involved. But the problem that I see is that a lot of the people that I grew up with have moved out and they have moved to, you know, to the big cities where they, you know, kind of are kind of part of, of that stratified uh, existence. Um, so, you know, with the few people that have been left behind, it's still kind of it, the, the old ways still apply, but I feel like, you know, the direction things are going in is this a bit more stratified thing where, okay, you're, the phases of life are you go to school, you go to college, you leave home, you go to work at, you know, the best job you can get with people your own age, obviously you're in that age cohort. So you, you date the people in your own age uh, and then you kind of live with the, in, in those agglomerated places. So, yeah, I don't know. It feels like that's kind of direction things are moving in. It's interesting because there's nothing inevitable about urban life being that, right? If you if you look at photographs from the 1940s or um you see a wider variety of people and and you know, you, you see neighborhoods where exactly there is that kind of intergenerational mixing. Um it, it's not until in, in the United States, of course, the left would say, oh, it's because they're a bunch of racists. Um, the, I would say it's more just the, what really happened to the cities in the United States was a massive crime wave um, coming out of the, the sexual revolution, the cultural revolution in the 1960s and 70s uh, that drove basically the middle class and families out of the city. Um, and and because because who, who nobody I mean the the safety of your family has to come first. It's it's one thing to live in sort of a sketchy neighborhood when you're um, in your twenties, but of course if you're older and you have a family, uh, you have to make those kinds of decisions. And of course the schools then collapsed as well. Um, and I think, but but we think about this as inevitable, and I don't see that it has to be that certain city life or urban life has to be this completely. Um, disconnected. The, the image in my head is what I call millennial housing, which I, I, full disclosure, totally live in a millennial housing building. <laughs> um, but it's it's sort of that like the the cheap buildings with a lot of glass. Um, they all have exactly the same look. They go up at the same time in neighborhoods, which is actually one one thing I love about New York is that it's so developed already that you at least stagger. You don't in D.C. When I lived in D.C the entire neighborhood will essentially built in the same five years, um, everything torn down and rebuilt in five years. So you get everything identical. It starts to feel very artificial, like a, some kind of Truman show or fishbowl or aquarium for, for, <laughs> for, um, you know, young professionals or whatever. Um, but that's what I think of when I think of modern growth of cities. And I don't think it has to be like that. And I don't think it has to be like it was in the 1970s where it's totally inhospitable, um, to families, it's not inevitable, but it does seem to be what cities are becoming or have been for the last 50 years. Yeah, I think it's it's probably the the accumulation of, of small, you know, incentives pointing in, in that direction. And like you said, you know, there's there are these generations that are much more separate than in the past. I mean, now most people go to college, most people try to aim to get, you know, a, a, a white collar job somewhere in, in the city. I mean, at least, you know, people people that, that I know, I'm sure there's there's there are entire strata of society that don't have this path, but at least this is kind of the aspirational path. This is what you should should be doing if you want to succeed you know it's it's the elite path um and then they only hang out with people from their own cohorts even internships you know you're you're hanging out with people kind of in your own generation yeah, uh, like the class you, thing uh, also 
the, the generational lines are hardened and the class lines are hardened. Um, and I don't think that that's inevitable. I guess that's where, maybe that's where I, I, I disagree some or, um, with some of the people that I find the most insightful on these questions. I don't, I don't like this idea of inevitability. Um, I think we get too trapped in that idea. Um, I, <laughs> frankly, I think, <laughs> I think life is pretty unpredictable, um, on the societal level, as well as on the individual level and anything that smacks of directionality or of linking. Cause if you, if you look hard enough, just like with genetics, if you go back far enough, you can find linkages between ideas any, two, you know, pick two, any, any two isms out of a hat and you can find some common ancestor, right? Um, but the, to me, the questions are more immediate and more um, like, what, what, what is the, the precipitating cause? Why now? Like, why, why did this happen now if it's so inevitable? Um, why was life so different 50 years ago, for example? Um, all the same quote unquote you know neoliberal forces were in in place in many ways um i i just I, I recoil from blaming Thomas Jefferson for something that is so clear to me the proximate cause is obviously the nineteen sixties i don't think any of this is inevitable i I think that people yeah. interact think with these ideologies in an unpredictable way and they have lots of unintended consequences and it, i don't know I, I I guess I'm much more a student of chaos theory. Yeah, yeah. I I think there's um you know guys there's a difference between inevitability and emergence. I think, you know, the the idea that um you know if if enough incentives are going to point a certain way and, and and you know enough don't point the other way to kind of equilibrate a system, then you know you're going to have these emergent phenomena. I think a lot of people talk about the fact that okay, you know, if if you if you move a few dominoes in, into one direction, then you, you know, you'll see down the line, you know, certain things are not necessarily that surprising. Um, you know, where, where, who was the first mover, you know, on, on this, you could say, if, you know, maybe it was, you know, the first tool maker in, in the Stone Age, you know, where, where, you know, he made life a bit more comfortable for his family. So that was the, that was the first uh, disintermediating step, you know, that was when, when capital entered, the, entered as, a, as a dark force. But so at the same I, time, you know, like you said, you know, these are, there, there is obviously a lot of positive in this. But there's also, you know, it's it's not an incontrovertible, you know, unalloyed good. So kind of balancing well, these is. two. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think the one constant and the one predictable aspect of life or, or looking at the civilizational level even, um, and I think to me what divides maybe um, the ide ideological spectrum more effectively or more meaningfully than anything else is the idea of fixed human nature. Um, I, I think how we interact with every incoming, both idea and practical and economic material circumstance is to some extent, um, it is to some extent chaotic, but the thing that makes it somewhat predictable is if you have a fixed conception of human nature, like I, I don't think people are fundamentally different than they were, um, at any point in time. That does not to say that ideas and societies and civilizations don't shape different kinds of people because they do, but some, some very basic aspects of, of human nature, for example, that people are not, um, not as a species inherently altruistic. Uh, these things are the only fixed posts for me in terms of how to, how to apply and, and how to apply that understanding of human nature as, as fundamentally negative and here's where I, I actually agree very strongly with re my religious friends and colleagues even though i'm not if you believe that man's nature is fallen then it, it leads you to a, a first of all a certain anti-utopianism right that that um, precludes for you some of the ideas i think um about fundamentally transforming society uh, you have you you inherit a deep skepticism of the idea of revolution, um, but that doesn't, I don't, I don't think that that, um, that means or, or determines any particular policy course or uh, obviously societies have been, functional societies have been built on a lot of different grounds, uh, but the common, the common thing to me and, and increasingly the only political division perhaps pre-political, but as applied to the political division that I care about is, do you, do you think man is, is changeable? 
Um, do you think that you can mold human beings um, into something fundamentally different from what we are? Or do you recognize that human nature is fixed, that human beings are not altruistic? Um, if you come from the religious tradition that we're fallen, if you're not, then just you're wired by evolution. Um, and if you accept some of those realities, then we can have a productive conversation about how do we build a society to maybe circle back to the feminist stuff? How do we build a society that accepts the fundamental premise that then tries to, you know, channel these forces in the most productive way possible, which recognizing that you're always going to fail in doing so and that you're not aiming for perfection, but just, you know, better than the state of nature. <laughs> right. So I don't know, to me, that's the only political division that ultimately matters. Everything else is a matter of application, policy, culture, um, particular tradition, all kinds of things. But if you think you're going to remake man, you're probably going to be build a monstrous society in, in the attempt. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree with you uh, on, on that front. And I, I share the, the tragic vision. Um, the the I'm curious what you think about the kind of technology, how how technology overlaps with with all of this, because this has been kind of the the accelerant, and it's also been a deliverer of miracles in a way. It actually had you can track a certain type of progress onto technology, where you know either in, in medical science or in you know the 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 vacuum works. My microwave is just kind of a miracle in itself. There's all sorts of like little miracles that, that science has delivered. Um, and I, I feel like a, a, a lot of people who kind of buy this, this kind of the, the liberal myth of progress that we're on, you know, we're on rails towards the, the utopian future. Uh, and if we're going to arrive soon in, in a world where, you know, everything's improved. Uh, it kind of tracks with technology. It's kind of, I feel like technology fuels this this mythology of, of progress that, okay, if we've managed to eradicate smallpox, we can fix the, you know, the dark heart of man, <laughs> whatever you believe about that. So, Well, maybe we can fix it by changing him into a machine. Um, that would be one strain of, of dystopian, in my view, dystopian. Yeah, yeah. Transhumanism <laughs> makes my skin, skin crawl. And also, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's funny because you know, you describe the same situation to some people and they think it sounds so exciting. And I'm like, it sounds like hell, just kill me now. I don't, I don't, I don't want to exist in this world. Um, no, I mean, I think the, the biggest change from technology and I'm, I'm not a, my dad's a software engineer. I'm not, I don't understand. I like, you know, the expression that cobbler's, um, cobbler's son goes without shoes or whatever that that kind of thing I, I refuse to learn anything about computers and technology because my dad does it did it for a living before he retired um so I just like out of pure spite <laughs> decided I'm gonna be basically a Luddite um no but I, I think the biggest especially when you broaden out technology to not just talk about like social media or, or some of the more popular tech companies or um but you touch on it as a, in a broader way, like for example, medical technology and all this, the, I think the biggest result has been to allow us to forget about nature as much as possible. Um, it, in Poglian terms, it would be, it allows us to be like extremely Apollonian and to forget that freezing, you know, freezing anything um, with sharp form and nature is an illusion. It might be beautiful and artistic and, and it might be great art but it is an illusion whereas people in previous eras lived uh lived in the constant uh throat like un under the sway of death for example in a way that we can forget that we do we still do but we can forget about it because we don't have half our children die before the age of five right because we don't interact with it in in an immediate and intimate way every single day um, that we can forget. We have, you know, we look good for longer, right? If you look at how people aged in the past because we have good nutrition, um, it allows us to imagine that we can extend our youth forever, right? Um, I, I, if you broaden technology out from just the, the stuff that I don't, I refuse to learn too much about, um, like Bitcoins or whatever, <laughs> I just take feminine prerogative here. I refuse to learn on the basis of feminine prerogative what Bitcoin is. Yeah, um, I, I let my husband collect the coins. <laughs> yeah. I let my husband do all of that stuff. I have no idea what any of it. I, I, um, 
no, but I, I think fundamentally the, the disconnect is uh, you can imagine that you're no longer ruled by biology, by nature, by it, it makes it easier to imagine and some people fully succeed in convincing themselves that in fact they are they are dominant over nature. They are dominant even over their own bodies. Um, and that's, I, I don't think that's, that's not a reality. Now, maybe transhumanism can make it a reality. And I, I find that even more disturbing than the concept of us forgetting <laughs> that, that we are under the dominion of nature. Yeah, I, it's to me, my, my problem with transhumanism is that I feel like it's, it, it, it's working with a stick figure representation of what it means to be human. We, ha we have no concept what it actually means to be human. Like, you know, our philosophy is poor, our science is poor, our reason is like a, a little keyhole that we, we peep through the world, you know, with our senses. Uh, it, there's, it's, it's not a comprehensive picture, though we have the illusion that it is a comprehensive picture, that we see everything and we know everything and we're like this, you know, super, super rational rational individual no you know kind of forcing our way through the world through through sheer will i don't know i wouldn't necessarily make big changes if you don't have a good theory of what exactly it is you are and and how you function and all of this stuff you know it's uh, it's a bit it's a bit iffy to me well, to... Our, our own bodies are still a complete mystery to us in many ways right medical science has advanced so much um and and yet we we don't understand so much about our own bodies about especially the effects of hormones and every, like, I, I'm, I'm kind of skeptical um, as a general rule that even, even something as intimate as our own bodies, that we're going to have a complete map. We don't fully understand in a thousand ways how our brains work. Um, I'm skeptical that if we can't even find a map to our own brains, that we're somehow going to also be able to find a map to the universe and the, and the meaning I, I have a, I, I guess I have a um, healthy sort of, I, I'm incredibly arrogant in some ways, but in other <laughs> personality wise, but in, in other ways, I, I, I do think I have a sort of a healthy perspective on what is possible to know. Um, and I, I think technology to return to your question, not only makes us imagine we can conquer nature, but makes us imagine that we can conquer all of the knowledge that exists in the universe that we can integrate it. You know, we're, we're pattern recognizing machines. That's our brains are essentially pattern recognizing machines. Um, but we're, we're, if you believe that we've evolved, we've evolved to recognize patterns that make sense within certain parameters, right? Um, neither the very, very small on the molecular level, no, nor the very, very big on the, the universe level, just patterns in this tiny little spectrum of, you know, just like visible light to the human eye, you know, this tiny little spectrum and, and, to, to then place all of your, um, use this, this word advised, advisedly, all of your faith uh, in your rational faculty when it has evolved uh, within this tiny little spectrum of light as to what is more advantageous within the specific conditions um, of the blink of an eye in geological time on this earth, to imagine that that faculty is... It should be the faculty that you then invest uh, such enormous hubris in seems to me to be misguided, misguided. I guess I understand that more if you are religious in a way. Like if you believe that the, the human person was formed in a, by a, an omnipotent, all-powerful God, then then maybe you do believe that, you know, your faculty of reason or, or your faculty of revelation um, can actually explain the things that exist. Um, but it seems to me to be, uh, an impossible position for an atheist to take. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's the thing, you know, in a way, modern atheism is, is pretty much patterned on, on this, uh, millenarian, uh, you know, mold as well. Like the idea that, you know, in, in a way it is kind of a Christian heresy, the idea that you know we we shall be saved through through reason through through science you know call it what you want science with a capital s you know the oh, this this particular facet of human life will will finally release us from our chains and will release us from unreason whatever that is you know from the from the from the body from from all sorts of ties to to you know uh, unchosen things yeah, I, I think you had a really good tweet about this today, actually, or yesterday. I don't know. I clicked on it today um, with regard to sex, right? The idea that we can control the sexual domain 
um, in, in this hyper rationalistic way is completely out of touch with the reality. And what happens when you do try is you, you lose the sexual nature of things. You lose the eroticism of it. Um, it's, it's impossible to control the sexual domain, uh, in this rationalistic way and still have it be sexy. Yeah. Um, you, you lose the essence of the thing in trying to control it. Exactly. Like, um, you know, organizing your sexual life through a spreadsheet might have some secondary effects, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, well, and, and the, the extreme, um, over saturation of sexual material also is sort of, um, it's kind of thumbing your nose at natural, the natural power of sex, right? Um, this force is irrational enough and innate enough to create life on, of, of, you know, every sexually re reproducing species. Uh, but you think that you can kind of mold it to, uh, to politically correct whims about, um, and, and, and to, to like, display it in it, what was once in nature re relatively rare in the sense that you know you had to do something to get it as a man um and and as a woman you had to do something to defend it um it, it if you think that you can replace that uh by by putting it um and making it sort of everywhere ubiquitous constant um your brain just gets exhausted. And that's, that's the saddest thing about all of this is that there's, <laughs> there's so little eroticism. It's, it's like the, the naivete of the 1960s was that we we're just going to have a great time after sexual liberation. And not only is that wrong for sort of moral reasons or happiness, re whatever, like you can think of all of, of the arguments um, around feminism and sexual liberation, but it also didn't bring us pleasure. I mean, I think that's actually agreed on by the left and the right now in a weird way, right? The left's answer has been, well, because it didn't bring pleasure, it's still the patriarchy and we're going to have to like create these contracts and these like legalistic structures to jam rules back onto human sexuality in a way that makes it completely unerotic and uninteresting. Um, and, and then the right goes back and says, well, this is why we had rules to begin with around this, because there are negative consequences. This is a powerful force that you don't mess around with um, in, in a trivializing way. But, but oddly, I think that there are very few people left, I think, after, what is it, 50 years of the sexual revolution, um, there are very few people left who would say that the state of, of like sexual liberation between the sexes right now is actually fun or pleasurable or um bringing people some some joy in life i think everyone thinks sex relations are terrible yeah yeah absolutely it's it's interesting though kind of how how the the the, the questions framed the the left keeps still has kind of the oppressor oppressed dynamic that they want to kind of jam into this thing where the only dysfunction that we see on total freedom is the fact that you know we still have oppressor oppressed dynamics happening and we need to to snuff them out and make sure that everyone's you know on, on even footing but that to me that that's just a, a spiral because you're not on even footing you know you, you are you are in sexual tension you represent two different life forces that you know are have to be in tension for it, this whole thing to to work um yeah the, the tension disappears so does any enjoyment out of the whole thing that you're going to get um the, the idea that i mean it's, it's so obvious for example that power dynamics are a part of every sexual relationship right like it's it's inherently part of the dynamic now not in the crude sort of flat way that I think the left talks about it. Um, but if you strip the idea of power out of sex, it's boring for women, especially maybe not for men, I, you know, may, <laughs> but um, for women, especially like women obviously are attracted to men with power, um, social power. It doesn't have to be as crude as like either um, political or, or financial power, but some kind of social dominance and power. Women are obviously attracted to that. Um, if, if you made everything equal, there would be nothing left. There would be nothing left of the tension between men and women that is actually the point 
Um, and not, not from the like grand perspective, obviously the point is to perpetuate the species, but like from the individualistic, even from the atomized, you know, pleasure seeking individualistic perspective, that's the point. You just gave away the whole game. Yeah. And it's interesting how they, they kind of, uh, take these power dynamics and then repackage them as kinks and make, make them kind of ratchet up to, to crazy levels where, you know, you have you know, you know, because you have no normal normalcy between the sexes, there's no tension anymore. You now have people being obsessed with BDSM and, and strangulation and, you know, getting, you know, I don't know, getting a shiner while they're while they're having sex. It's it's quite I don't know. A, a lot of things are, are getting out of hand. I kind of understand what they're trying to compensate for. Uh, and then they obviously there's this whole layer of consent where, you know, you can I don't know, choke me, but you have to get my consent before. And it's just like, I feel like it's, this is still not very good. <laughs> this sounds absolutely terrible. Consent is not, consent is, is an important baseline in terms of the fact that, you know, every civilization exactly uh, finds the horror in rape. Uh, rape is natural, but it's, why we build civilization among other reasons to prevent right um consent is incredibly important as a baseline but the idea that this concept explains anything beyond the like the baseline of sexuality is crazy um and and it's it's endlessly malleable right so like okay let's say you have the the consent form okay it's completely unsexy but let's go over that uh, let's let's have everybody all parties in the contract sign uh on to certain activities how do you know that you truly consented when you signed i mean was there pressure because this is i mean it's an endless it's turtles all the way down you can't stop it um because it's fundamentally the wrong lens through which to view good or bad sex yes rape is a type of bad sex but it's not the only type of bad sex <laughs> And, and in order to avoid that kind of moralistic, judgmental language, like good and bad sex, we tried to make consent um, cover all of these concepts in the process. Not only have we created this unsexy idea of, of, you know, consent apps and whatever that won't even solve the fundamental problem they're trying to solve, uh, but we've created a, a potentially tyrannical minefield for men where uh, men have to read women's minds and their intentions when exactly as any man who's ever tried to seduce a woman knows um, a large part of the game is that no does sometimes mean yes and and like so men essentially have two choices they can um you know they can they can get laid or um they can follow the rules and be safe from the legalistic system <laughs> And I, I think you're seeing men choose one or the other, right? Uh, and of course, there's the the, the aspect that um, it also depends on how charming you are, and um, and if if you are an awkward man, the the line for what you get written up for by the system is uh, is very very different than if you're charming and um, you know socially dominant and and powerful. Um, but it's created a minefield where you get this either either you have to just rely on your wits to get you out of it and to make sure that the women aren't regretful afterwards or uh you just give up on women altogether um and you invest yourself in in only fans and in um whatever in whatever substitutes you might need and and you you go your own way uh, but this all comes fundamentally from this flawed idea that you can create good sex by essentially legalistic means and through this lens of consent that is completely impoverished and useless except for the most basic rule of you know yes forcible rape is is a crime uh, it ought to be a crime it's a terrible crime and, and virtually every civilization recognizes it as such uh, but beyond that it doesn't tell you anything yeah yeah absolutely i think there's 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 something about the fact that you know outside of consent there's not really we haven't made any allowances for any other norms so you know 
historically there were there were norms b between how you know how men and women typically the, the normatively uh, engage with each other and the um the, the baseline was that was no you should not you know have sex with the outside of marriage outside of you know different strictures depending on the culture obviously but there were strictures and they were enforced by you know either the the inner mental states of the of the couple mostly the woman by older women in the in the society by by everyone observing the 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 relationship they were they were relatively enforced now the idea is that okay consent is enough you just use consent whatever happens consent is enough and i feel like this this has led to a kind of an impoverishment of of how people talk about sex because there's no expectation of you know i don't know what you want you don't know what I want. We don't, the, the, the level of communication is, you know, the level of coordination between people is, is super low. Uh, and I feel like a lot of this Me Too stuff and a lot of, you know, you know Aziz Ansari level confusion and weirdness comes from the fact that there is no agreement upon what one should do, uh, what one, you know, is expected to do, what is good, what is bad, and how we should negotiate these relationships. Because, you know, people are very different, obviously, and they have different things. And I feel like a lot of women subject themselves to things that they may not necessarily be comfortable with because there is no, you know, it's like, okay, I'm just going to go with it and expect him to, like you said, read my mind because... You know, I can always, you know, retract consent, or I can always think that, you know, this, 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 this wasn't good because consent is my only, my only tool in my little toolbox. Yeah, it's um, it's even one step more complicated than that. That you know, the, the consent model assumes that a woman knows her own mind at any given time, which, and any any uh, so sexist grandpa oh. will tell you, uh, is is. It is the female prerogative not to know what we want. God damn it. We don't, <laughs> we don't have to know what we want at any given time. It's your job to make us figure out what we want. Um, yeah, that sounds you know, pretty it, hot to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, <laughs> um, no woman actually wants to, to lay out in advance um, all the things that she'll accept who knows what will accept it depends on you know it depends on the uh on the guy and and how well he performs his role in this whole seduction game um it's it i, I don't know i the idea that um women are freer when they have to behave like men with regard to sex is ludicrous I don't want to behave like men with, with regard to sex. I don't have any of the same biological imperatives. I don't have any of the same, like there's huge biological brain differences and what turns men and women on. Um, I don't want to have to deal with any of this. I present having to deal with it. I think that it should be, <laughs> I think that men should be um, in charge of coming up with ways uh, to, to make us want to go to bed with them. I resent the idea that I'm the one who's supposed to come up with, with this, uh, these rules. <laughs> um, no, obviously I, I know that people will take what I said out of context and I'll, I'll suddenly oh, I, in defense, of, in defense of, of rape or whatever. No, um, obviously there are some hard, hard rules, but everything else, um, is a matter of negotiation. It's a matter of, of, um, this very exciting tension between, between the sexes. Um, that we are completely losing and, and in a schizophrenic way, right? Like there are two major uh, completely um, incompatible threads in, in our modern culture with regard to this. One is that we share our feelings about absolutely everything, right? Uh, AOC is crying about her alleged assault when she's talking about national politics um, it, it, there's this constant push, tell your story, tell your story. Everybody has to recognize if you feel uncomfortable, unsafe, you know, like all of the, everybody is, is this therapeutic, um, you know, uh, and, and performative way of sharing your, your intimate feelings. And the, in some cases, the worst experiences of your life with the whole world all the time for political purposes. And yet in circumstances where it's supposed to be intimate, um, the worst thing you can do is catch feelings. This is psycho. And then the other, the other um, sort of tension or, or schizophrenia is really the right word for it, is that in the workplace, 
men and women are supposed to be completely interchangeable sexless automatons who never relate to each other in any way, recognizing the fact that they might be male and female and that, you know, sort of sexual attraction is possible. Um, so on the one hand, on one side of the, the sort of office door, you're supposed to relate to human beings as though they have no sex at all. And then as soon as you step out on the other side of the door and go to the bar for a drink, the default is yes. Which is, by the way, why it's so much more insulting now to turn down a man. Rejection is a lot sharper for men when the default is yes rather than no. Because before you could imagine, well, she's a good girl. She doesn't do it with anybody. It's not something in particular about me uh, that she rejected. It's, it's you know, I, I, it's, it's the idea of sex out of marriage, for example, or whatever. Now, um, it's, very, it's much more personal, right? Uh, if a woman doesn't have sex with you as a man, it's it's a statement on um, on on you. Uh, anyway, but these are the two like bizarre uh, tensions I find like that one that you're supposed to be spilling your guts all the time, except when you're in bed with someone and actually intimate with them, which is an anachron like a anachronistic word at this point. Then you're not supposed to spill your guts. You're supposed to play it completely cool. Um, as though it, it's completely meaningless. Everywhere else you can spill your guts, not, not in bed or not, not, you know what I mean? Not during, <laughs> like with somebody that you would take into your bed, not supposed to, not supposed to spill your guts. And then in work, you're supposed to be genderless. But as soon as you walk down the, to the street, to the bar, the default is yes. And we're all supposed to be like, um, you know, down uh, to, to have sex with, with anybody uh, who interacts with us. But inside the workplace, that's forbidden. You, you not only can you not, you know, interact sexually with your coworkers, uh, you, if, if you in, misinterpret a casual joke or comment that could be construed as sexual, it's criminal. This, I don't, I don't understand how I'm, I'm just makes me really, really grateful that like, I just basically got out pretty early on from this kind of melee, um, uh, because, I just, I just find it completely baffling and confusing and inconsistent. Absolutely. How, how much do you think this, uh, this not catching feelings uh, idea is tied to kind of maintaining optionality? I feel like a lot of people just don't want to, you know, be tied down or, you know, commit to, to anything because once you've, you've closed off one, one chapter of your life, uh, uh, you're, you're just, uh, yeah, you're trapped. You don't want to be trapped. I think that's definitely part of it. I think the other part of it is always um, projection from one sex to the other for what they're looking for, right? Women are looking for men who have options because a man not having options says something about how fit he is as a partner, right? Um, women, by definition, I mean, very rare exceptions, have sexual options. The, 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 the question is the quality of those sexual options, right? Um, but I think it's kind of a, a projection that you are a more alluring partner to a man if you have options, but that it just doesn't work that way. It's like um, it's like when you see pop stars, beautiful women, um, you know, singing these songs about how like they're sleeping with a bunch of different guys as though it's an accomplishment. Yes, you're you're a beautiful woman. Um, men will want to sleep with you. It's not that hard. It's not an accomplishment. Um, but I think there's a certain amount of this sort of confusion because we think men and women are identical and we project what we want. So women are behaving like the men that they want to, to attract. And I think that's a large part of this catching feelings thing. And then of course, there's just the inevitable heartache and disappointment because there are so many casual relationships. Um, there's no there's no cultural sanction for a woman to demand that a man actually commit to her, even forget about marriage. I mean, even on a, a dating level or an exclusivity level, um, just because she had sex with him. So there's just, a, there's an element of, of preempting the heartbreak for yourself, I think, and trying to rationalize and convince yourself that you don't care. So, yeah, I mean, I do think that it's about foreclosing options, but actually I, I, I tend to think again, that that's a bit of a cover. That's what we tell ourselves or each other. Um, that's what women who are on the track to become the next girl bosses tell themselves, uh, oh no, I'm not, I'm not settling down with him because I want options. I want 
to travel in my 20s or whatever it is that people tell themselves instead of the more ugly reality, which is you know that he's not going to date you. Yeah. I think that's that's increasingly the case. I mean, just just to, the nature of of how men date and how women date, and the fact that you know, kind of this this algorithmic app dating is becoming the norm, especially kind of in, in urban centers, and you know, essentially what it's not this becoming stuff... the norm. It has become the norm. I I I actually I have I got out right. I started dating my husband in 2011, so I got out, and we met through a friend. I. So in 2011, in like sort of New York, D.C., San Francisco, I don't know, it probably took some time to to travel into the rest of the country. Um, But at that time, it was still optional. So 2011, I think, is the last year, maybe maybe it's like a year or two after that, that it was still optional. Like it was around. Most people were on it. I I made a profile one time and then immediately got off because it matched me with my ex-boyfriend. I was like, that this is a bad app. Um, No, but uh, out of all the all the people on that app. Right. no, but it was still optional, like as in there were still people trying to date in person. So there were still attempts being made um, in, a, in an in-person setting all the time where like, you know, if you were open to dating, like you would meet people, you might hit it off and, and they would ask you out. And and so there was still that option. You could do it analog. Now, I, I think you basically can't. From what I hear from my friends who are dating, you have to be on those apps because people don't even approach each other anymore. Um, it's not even really an option unless it happens in a completely organic way where like you just happen to both be at the same party and have a mutual friend and meet that way. Um, but in terms of intentional dating, nobody even comes up and asks you out anymore unless you're on these apps. This is how people get dates now. It is the dominant form of dating. And it, it encourages everybody to, to view each other as a checklist. So. I, I don't know. I'm I'm quite down on the on the whole thing, but I, I also recognize that I don't think there are alternatives. I think if, if you try to stay off the apps now and you're trying to look for somebody, um you just won't be visible to the vast majority of people who are also looking. Yeah, and it, it's it is kind of skewing towards the people that, you know, they, they do well on these apps, you know, obviously people who are visually interesting, who have maybe some status markers, uh, you know, that that just, you know, that they, they do well on the apps for, for women, in a way, more women will get dates. But for men, it's probably going to be, you know, a handful of uh, apex predators gathering a, a large harem. And that's that's about it. And then we can, we can close up shop for everyone else. Because it's just, you know, if these guys have enough slots in their diary, uh, yeah, they're gonna fill up. <laughs> There's not, <laughs> they don't need enough more. slots on their dance card to, to flip the analogy from a different time. Um, no, that that's true. I mean, that's true in in without the apps too, to some degree. Like, I don't know if that's a function of the apps as much as it is of sexual liberation of women, um, and of a later marriage age. Uh, but it certainly isn't helped by the apps. I, I was thinking more on the lines of personal chemistry. Like, again, this is where I disagree with some of the like the the pickup artists or whatever. It, yes, what they're saying is true in kind of a um, a game of averages or on an abstract level, but there still is such a thing as individual compatibility. Now it's within parameters, obviously, like um, if, if people are not sexually attracted to each other uh, because of some of those biological imperatives, then individual compatibility won't matter. But there's not just, you know, um, it's not just a, a, a game. It's not just a matter of, of the right lines and the right, uh, that might work in terms of initial attraction, but you do want somebody that you have a compatibility with, that you have some values in common with, that um, you can actually find interesting longer term. Um, but but all of those things, that kind of personal chemistry, you can't duplicate on an app. Um, and and sometimes that personal chemistry takes some time to develop. And what I've I've seen just anecdotally with my friends is that nobody has any time to find out whether it. it um, that that kind of personal pe- chemistry might actually develop because everybody is super super checklist happy and they go on a date and if it's not if it's not fantastic then they um, you know they know that they have twenty more options on on the app so it, it increases the volume and decreases the sensitivity to actual individual compatibility um, 
but that's anecdotal. I don't, you know, I don't have a like larger theory of this. Just that I don't like it. Just like with transhumanism, I don't have like a, a deep intellectual reason. I just, I just am uh, instinctively uh, revolt from, I'm repulsed by it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's got its pitfalls for sure. And I think, yeah, that tracks pretty well with my experience and what I've seen with friends as well. Um, I, I think the, the biggest pitfall for women is to fall in that um, kind of friends with benefits region where they're just kind of orbiting someone that they really like, but the guy is not invested and he has no incentive to, to invest in any relationship with her. And then he'll maybe keep her around for a while and, and she'd be, yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it's just a, a maddening situation because, you know, we, we, we put everything under this umbrella of dating, you know, I'm dating, he's dating, she's dating, but dating means very they different date. things. Yeah. They dating is how to use it as the singular. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it, it just means different things to different people. Like, you know, for someone who's, you know, quite successful and maybe is a guy, it, it might not be that, you know, they're dating to find someone long term or, you know, they, they might be extremely picky in, in how they do that. So, yeah. And unfortunately, I know a lot of, of girls who are, you know, who, who are very, very disappointed by, by, this, by this reality. And they, it, it feels like a really, you know, bad equilibrium. This is very hard to kind of get yourself out of it, especially if you kind of fall, fall in love with someone and they're just kind of keeping you around as part of their rotation. Yeah. I mean, I think that's probably an incredibly painful experience. The other thing is that our society now discourages, it's like, um, because they see everything as a lens of power and everything, um, looking older for women, which is not all, I mean, my husband is just a year older than me. Um, I'm not dogmatic about any of these things. Um, but I, I do find, especially now I'm 33, I find that my male friends who are in their mid to late thirties, um, whereas previously they might've been most interested in trying to maintain a harem of women, um, they hit, they hit a, a wall for companionship too. At that age, they start to, um, really want to seriously date as opposed to like, try to sleep with as many women as possible. Um, and it seems to me that it, it's pretty, it, it, there may be a lot of good matches between women who a lot of women hit that in our modern society, forget about what, what happened a hundred years ago, but in our modern society, I think a lot of women hit that point, let's say between 25 and 30. Um, but they're trying to date men also within 25 to 30, and maybe it would make more sense for them to date in men in their late thirties or early forties who have also decided that they want a kid, they want to seriously date for marriage and companionship. Um, cause in my, again, in my anecdotal experience, this is a real thing that happens. I know that on the, you know, the, the internet boards or whatever, there are all these men saying like that they want to maintain this kind of, um, like harem style, uh, juggling plates or whatever in, in practice, even, even the men I know who are very successful with women by the time they hit their early forties, they're exhausted. They don't want to do it anymore. Um, and, and they do want something more stable, more, they want a companion in their lives and not just, they've already proved to themselves that they can. Right. Um, and it, it, it loses its luster even for men after a while. It, it, probably never had much luster for women except in the heads of naive feminists in 1970. Um, but even for men, I think it does lose its luster after a while. Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's true. And I, I also know a few, a few men in, in the situation where they, they kind of want to, you know, have a, have a marriage, have a, have a more serious relationship, but the, the kind of the hot water that they're in at that point is that they're a bit numb to what's out there. Yeah. They, they kind of keep shopping around and, and, you know, there's no one's perfect. Well, you know, cause you, you kind of, you have this availability of women and they all have obviously different qualities, different, you know, physical, mental, you know, values that they bring to the table. Uh, and then you kind of just keep on moving to the next one and say, oh, this one's not really good. She's, she's not, she's just not the one. Uh, and I feel like after a certain time, you, you probably it's, you know, even, even, you know, male pair bonding goes, goes by the wayside. It gets, it gets a bit harder to, to just decide, okay, this is, this is the one. Well, to, to, um, give you a point in your, in your 
arsenal on on consumerism. It is treating human beings as consumable products. Um, and why not? We treat everything else as a consumable product. Um, look, the market will deliver. It'll deliver what we want. The problem is, you know, some of the things we want are, are spectacularly bad for us. Yeah, and I feel like people just need to to under to understand to get better mental armor for what this is for where we are in history and in technology and, and all of this like I've, I've met my husband on on a dating app we met on okay cupid we're happily married you know i couldn't i wouldn't want to have it any other way um so you can make this stuff work for you yeah, people you, do i mean I, I that's why i said it's not like a um i'm no way discouraging people from using these apps i think actually if you don't use these apps today you are potentially not going to meet somebody who might be really great for you. I just, I, I think it's a really good way of thinking about it. Um, you got to put on armor, but not the type of armor that I think the culture encourages us to have, which is essentially to, to close the armor around your heart and your feelings um, rather than on the outside of your body. <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, I, 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 I think, um, and again, I, I don't have any religious precepts. I don't, I don't think it's immoral um, to have sex outside of marriage, but I, I do think that it's generally to have sex without commitment from men um, is usually heartbreaking for women. And if you find that you have to like force yourself not to feel, then it's probably not a good thing that you're doing for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a trap. Yeah. Um, and yeah, what you were saying about, about armor. Yeah. I think I, I completely echo that. Yeah. I think it's, it's just to, to understand that everything is a tool, but you don't really need to deal with it on its own terms. You know, you don't necessarily need to, you know, respect what the product is telling you, the indications you use it in, in your own way. Like for example, you know, these apps are a database of, of people that you might match with. I know it sounds really abstract, but it's like, it really does help you connect with people that you otherwise might not have met. Or, you know, if you were like in the ancestral village, you would have either had the, the baker's son or the butcher's son, and that was it. And if they're idiots, then I'm sorry. Uh, but in, in this way, you can get a little bit of more variety, but you need to wear your armor. So before I, I let you go, I'll ask you the show question, because I know we're, we're running over a little bit. Um, do you have a subversive thinker, writer, living or dead, you know, it could be anything um, that was inspirational to you, but that you think people might not have heard of or might need a little bit more time in the sun? All, all the people I would list are, are pretty um, well known. I mean, the first person that comes to mind is Palia, um, but that's not a, a novel recommendation for anyone. Um, I, and you know, all the, all the usual suspects. Um, I, if, if there's something unusual that I would recommend. Yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't be... have to be completely, you know, off the beaten path. It can, can be someone even if, even if they're, it just has to be kind of an influential figure. Yeah. I mean, I obviously was heavily influenced by Palia. Um, and actually, I mean, I would say that Simone de Beauvoir, um, influenced me a lot in the opposite direction in the sense that I think it's worth reading because she is brilliant um, and eclectic and interesting um, and draws you into her worldview. Uh, and I think that it's really important to read her as like, it's the, I, I think she presents it in a much better way than say Betty Friedan or a lot of the Americans and certainly like the later feminists do. Um, I think she presents the material in a way that makes it both seem plausible and seem exciting. And that's, that's, that's the real lure, right? Um, and, and so I, I think it's worth reading in the sense that it's the best possible presentation of the enemy, uh, <laughs> the opponent should say. Um, but in, in terms of actually, I would, I would say, I, I cited it earlier, it's not a book, um, it's a movie. The, the, the movie that has had the most impact on how I think about a lot of these things, um, especially this relation of economics and culture, uh, it's probably Cold War, um, which is a uh, Polish movie 
um, beautifully shot, worth seeing. It won, I think, best for an Oscar, or at least was nominated. I don't pay attention to the Oscars anymore, but um, but it's worth seeing as cinema. But it's also, I think, one of the best expositions on the interplay between the public and the personal, um, and how even very difficult personal relations can be um, irrevocably thrown off or changed by by civilization, by, by the world in which you live. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's quite anti-atomistic in, in the sense that these are two individuals who have all of these, all of their own problems that may or may not have been able to make it work with their own problems. And, and, and to me, this is a, a kind of important metaphor for a larger, um, what we're dealing with. I feel like it's so difficult, particularly in, in the realm of relationships, it's so difficult for the sexes to make it work anyway. It's beautiful and exciting, but it's difficult. Like we are different. We don't understand each other. Oftentimes we are at cross purposes. It is difficult and hard and heartbreaking and, and all of those things already. And then if you throw on top of it, some kind of rigid system or ideology that steers you away from the truth about yourself, whether that's something imposed like the communistic system, that communist system that literally makes a lot of your decisions for you, um, or uh, whether that's an ideology that you've, you've um, imbibed growing up, um, which I think that more radical feminism is, or even just mainstream feminism is, it makes those things that much harder. It's not that there's some kind of utopian bliss available if, if you just rescue yourself from feminism. That's not the case at all. Um, but it will give you a better understanding of yourself to actually, you know, embody your biology and, and accept that it, it does actually form some of the things that you thought were just um, sort of that you formed by a matter of sheer will about yourself. Um, and I find that to be actually very empowering. Um, so that message could be flexible about politics or about relationships, but that the ideas of accepting some, some realities, constraints, um, and, and not then creating additional ones, whether they're from ideology or from a, a, a bad system, um, life is hard enough is, I guess what I would say. <laughs> life is hard enough without creating additional, uh, additional barriers to, uh, the possibility of meaning and happiness from either uh, the civilization in which you live or an ideology that you adopt. Yeah, I, I really like that message. And yeah, it kind of drives from the idea of, of trade-offs as well. I feel like people need to need to become very comfortable with trade-offs because that's, that's about 90% of, of wisdom, understanding that, you know, you, you can't have it all. Um, well, thank you so much, Inez. This was really, really fun. Um, is there uh, something you're working on or a place where people can find you? Leave us with your deets. Sure. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at, at Inez Felcher. Um, I haven't changed that to my married name, Stepman, because if I do, the Twitter overlords will take away my precious blue check mark. Uh, and <laughs> you can't change your handle without losing your check mark. Uh, and I have no doubt they will not return that to me because I got it when it was really easy. Um, <laughs> and they didn't hate conservatives as much because there weren't barely any of us, anyways. Um, and then, as you said at the beginning of the, uh, the show, I just launched a podcast called High Noon with Inez Stepman. It's through my employer, Independent Women's Forum. So you can find my work at iwf.org. And then um, please check out my podcast because it's now, it's now my baby and we'll have to have, have you on, Alex. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm excited to come on. Um, well, thanks so much. And yeah, I can't wait for the next time I see you and we chat about similar themes. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for having me. It's been wonderful.